Okay, good here. evening and welcome to the public safety meeting of March 2nd, 2015. It being 5.30, I'll call this meeting to order and note that in attendance are Councillor Murphy, Councillor Adams, Councillor Dwight, and I will be presiding, uh, Councillor Maureen Carney. Also with us is Clerk to the Council, Pamela Powers, and our presentation this evening from Chief Russ Sinkowitz from the Northampton Police Department. I will ask, I will first announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded, and ask if there is public comment. And seeing none, I'll ask if there are motions to approve two sets of meetings, the first being October 6th. Um, motion to accept both sets of meetings for that. Okay, we, had, we have a set for October 6th and a set for December 1st. I'll second that. So motion to accept both sets of meetings. Are there any additions, corrections, or notes otherwise? Not hearing any, I'll ask if then for those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? None. Okay, those meetings are accepted, and I will note that the health department that was slated to present this evening is unable to present due to illness, and we'll move right then forward to the police department, and uh, Chief Russ Sinkowitz. Um, we are invited here to do a response to resistance presentation, and Sergeant Caputo, in my office today was all set to rock and roll. They just texted him to see uh, where he is. And I, it's very unlike him not to be here on time. So I, I don't have anything to give. We were asked to do what is normally three to four hour presentation at the Citizens Police Academy, which I believe Al invited you to um, earlier this year. I could arrange for that one evening for anyone who wanted to go to it too. Go to it. Anybody coming? <laughs> so uh, we're asked to condense it to half an hour, keep the, the presentation together in 26 minutes, and hope, hoping they'll get here very, very shortly. Okay. I'm surprised. Um, he didn't get here at five, did he? Well, I got here at five. There's nobody here, so I went wandering around. He knew five that he was supposed to get here before 5:30. He needed the projection set up, which we arranged. And again, I just texted him, I don't know what's up. Um, in the meantime, I can fill you in on a few things in the department. Um, it'll be part of my one-page narrative. Uh, I haven't had my meeting with the mayor over the budget yet, but we've, we're directed to do uh, level services, budget for any increased uh, contractual agreements, uh, level fund OM, which is what I did, uh, and overall, you will see, and Susan Wright will point it out, <clears throat> it might be a little shocking to see that it's a 6.9% overall uh, increase in my budget, but that covers the full two years of collective bargaining agreements that were settled for both the patrol and the sergeants. Uh, and then the associated raises that everybody, the lieutenants and captains get as a result, plus contract settlements with uh, uh, the represented clericals and then the non-represented with their colas. We also, as part of the capital improvement project, you know, for years I've like said that capital improvements to, instead of coming for that extra vehicle every year, even though we have three new vehicles in our OOM, our regular budget, um, I'd much rather build it into the regular budget than coming and completing the CIP. So uh, the plan is, that, at least for this year, to add one into my OOM. That's also part of the 6.9%. That's about 51,000 and some change. And then transition in the second year to just getting all five vehicles um, as part of the regular budget. So I won't be competing with other large ticket items that are important, but where I've always believed the vehicle should be, you know, and then that gives me the flexibility to have an administrative unmarked or truck or marked units or whatever it is we may need year to year. But we've been living in three new cars, uh, three marked cruisers forever, and then have to get the sergeant's car or a DB car or a truck or whatever through the capital improvements process. 
so that's changed. Uh, got reaccredited this year in October. We just got the uh, confirmation letter, so there's going to be a press release about that. Uh, and no sign of check the hearing room but there's another meeting going on here so yeah I'll, I'll just keep going back here I really apologize he's so dedicated to so much time with everything um, in terms of all our hiring but the difficulties we had started two years ago or a little over 18 months ago <coughs> we uh, put seven in last summer's uh, police academy one dropped out Day one, six graduated, six have just completed the field training officer program, are in the field and all doing very well. We have currently five in this academy class, I'm sorry, five that graduated from the last academy class in February uh, and are now just in their fourth week of field training program and they all look like they're doing just fine as well. And the academy class that started in February, we have three uh, in that class make it through the first two or three weeks there, you're doing pretty good. They've all passed the physicals and their, their uh, agility and their academic courses. So uh, I believe this might be coming right here. Hello? Oh, you thought six. Well, we're, I'm stalling for time here, so. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because we have a couple of possible retirements, a couple long-term injuries, um, we are looking at, we have three people lined up for the August already from our most recent test. Uh, all got through the physicals or psychological, we just got them all lined up and ready to go. Two of them are returning uh, veterans uh, from the Middle East that we couldn't hire before. So we're hoping that uh, we'll be in a position to put them into the August again. We all set for staffing. Uh, we've also paid attention to new captains in the past year, to new lieutenants, former uh, sergeants. We just reinstituted the detective sergeant's position, which this actually been put up. That has been vacant for a while because of our staffing shortages. Uh, we have one sergeant on long-term injury leave, so we just recently appointed an acting off the sergeant's test that we just gave a month, a month ago. So we can fill in that slot. Um, we are actively looking for a additional detective, and I say additional only as much as one more body in there. But we've dedicated one detective to the full-time drug and gang task force, the district attorney's initiative um, that has some grant funding. We get some money from it, and uh, he's that detective is going to stay there. But I, I need another detective full-time, especially on the evening shift. Drug Task Force Detective, who was, uh, I think we did, and I might have it in here in my notes, but um, 26 search warrants and 63 arrests in nine months. Almost all of them were linked to information or drugs that come into their camp. So even though it's a regional effort, it really has a lot of effect on uh, people here. Some bigger operations are linked that lived outside of North Camp who were flowing drugs into our camp. Um, so that works pretty, worked out very good. He's walking over slow, so any questions you might have on anything? I'm just kind of giving you some updated highlights. I don't have any questions, but if we still have a minute before he gets here, I can, um, I'll explain why I actually requested the, the presentation to begin with. We can talk about this if you want. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, because we were here in October 13th yeah. and did a presentation, so. Well, the reason, the reason why I requested is because, um, you know, with, with incidents that happen in other, other places in the country, like, you know, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, um, I, I wonder, and I think others wonder if it could happen here, those sorts, those sorts of incidents. And I note that we have very few minorities in Northampton, and very few people of color, um, and few people of color in the department. And, um, and we had the Jonas Creek incident where there was a man of color based and he, he was subsequently charged and the charges were ultimately null crossed. Um, after the um, Black Lives Matter 
uh, rally last year, the uh, Pretoria Officers Union wrote a letter asking Councillor Klein to apologize. She made uh, for comments she made at the rally. Now, I know that's not a statement of the department. It has nothing to do with the chief. Um, but in the letter, they took the time to explain both the process and the outcome of what happened in the Michael Brown case, which I found surprising and concerning. And, um, and, the, and the final thing was that we did have the use of force, it was called use of force back then, presentation back in October of 2013. Um, and one of the things that we were, that we learned at that point, I, I remember Officer Sherrick said very clearly that police officers' perception in the line of duty can't be questioned, and it's always correct. It's never incorrect. I remember hearing that, and it stuck with me. And Councillor Carney asked right after he said it a really good question, which was, well, if they're, you know, racially profiling, you know, like racial, racial profiling sometimes occurs. So for me, um, I thought about what's happened since we had that presentation at other in other places in the country, and, uh, and, and I'm wondering if, if, our, the police in Northampton are trained that their perception is, is, is always correct. So um, that, that's why I made the request. Okay. Um, are there any other counselors for the question? Uh, uh, I, the question else? I was going to ask was actually relevant to staff and that. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, my time since uh, right, well, it's long. Um, you, that means if we get success, if we hold on to the three that are pending right now, that would be 14 new uh, officers. It's a, it's five, yeah. And with the potential for a few more, too. So the, that's a significant portion of the department. Uh, a lot of green shirts. Young supervisors. And again, we have one officer that's highly likely to fly to the fire department. Uh, he's a registered nurse. He worked for us, got his degree, could get hired as a nurse, came back to work as a police officer. This is the medical aspect of it. Uh, got his uh, full certification for paramedic. And his desire is to move over there. That's the next opening. So, you know, he's the potential uh, uh, loss, so to speak. Uh, we have one other one that's uh, detaining a uh, move to Holyoke. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in a position because we're not civil service that we have given timely tests to maintain a, an active roster of people to just quickly move in. So, and for example, if, 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 you, if you do follow the for Holyoke, but the fact that they're making promotions, but they don't have a valid promotional list from civil service for seven years and don't expect them for another year. The departments are suffering the same fate with police officers trying to hire them in a timely manner. And because we've got out of civil service, we have the ability uh, to, you know, to, to plan ahead and get these people in place. So. so, But we're as close to full strength as we've ever been. Correct. Correct. That's what gives us a latitude to add a detective within my budget. We have not uh, grant that we filed for a school resource officer that we're waiting to hear from. That would be nice if we did it because that would give me the money for the additional body and if we did that, that would be an additional person in the August Academy because it's a three-year grant. Uh, but we're still looking at uh, finding someone that wants to do school resource officer because they have more, a lot more latitude in the personnel room. So, you know, I made that not a promise, but uh, the superintendent provost, in fact, we really want to get someone in, at least in public high school, uh, in spite of the legislation at the state level that mandates what the budget is doing, but not what the budget is doing. We've got about the original power on the state level, so it's a crazy world. I think the point that <coughs> Councilor was making is that that's like 25% of the department that's a turnover, which is significant. Um, People kind of miss the overtime, but they don't miss working all the overtime. But in terms of the in terms of the makeup of the department, to have that much of a turnover at once, uh, are there some specific things you're doing to address the um, the change in the 
in the makeup of the department in terms of? There was quite a bit of transition after our difficulties with the captain and the reference person. There's other people that left. Uh, the officers are very happy with the contracts so that they have. We just completed, I should have brought some information about it, a client survey. And 87% of the employees would highly recommend another officer to come to work here because of the environment is so good. And even the negative comments were above the 50 percentile of the scale that we're using, the one to five scale of everything. The worst one's like the 3.25%. Um, so we've turned a corner, the morale's up, we're satisfied with the building. We realize we have some of the best equipment. Training opportunities that we're having, the quality of supervisors that we put in place, they've all been appreciated and reflects in our minds. So it's a very positive environment there now. So, you have anywhere? Do you have full staffing? Is that you, 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 I know you asked that question, right? Well, close, you're not at full staff. Well, I'm not at full staffing because I have five in training. Right, would you, well, would you be after, after August if the, if the two that? And if when the three get out of the academy and make it through the training, that would be full set. <coughs> Have you had that before? In my tenure, no. Welcome. Okay. Sergeant Stokes? Yep. Sergeant Caputo? Uh, and um, maybe I'll let, I'll defer to the chief to introduce. Uh, you ready or? We, my cable won't connect to there, so we've got to transfer it to a thumb drive and not to our computer for this stuff. Oh, okay. Go, so we're still we doing cannot. some technical difficulties. Yeah, but while this is going, we can get started on some stuff. And I'll just say that you weren't, you weren't here when Councilor Adams uh, just kind of gave a general overview for why we're, why he requested this meeting, which is kind of in the context of national issues and um, also in the context of a uh, letter that was, that was received from the Patrolman's Union. But also, um, uh, it was Officer Sherak who gave the last uh, presentation, and at that time it was called Use of Force. Now we have a, a, a change of a name, it's the response to resistance. So maybe uh, if during your presentation, um, you might address a couple of those things. Was there something that I missed, Councilor Adams, that you're hoping that? Uh, um, I heard the sorry. perception no, thing when I came in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that might be a good thing to cover while we're waiting for the 72% uh, to climb to 100 here on this <laughs> bar. But um, yeah, uh, I wasn't here for Officer Sheriff's presentation, um, but I am familiar with the concept, and I don't, I wasn't, I don't, wasn't here to hear the exact wording, but. Basically, what what said is uh, an officer's perception is their perception. Basically, the perception could be questioned down the road, but it's going to be hard for anyone to, to put themselves in the mind of that officer at that time and uh, um, say what their perception was. Uh, one thing that uh, comes up a lot, you know, the standards, uh, Graham versus Connor, uh, Supreme Court case comes back to reasonable officer's perspective, and it's 2020 on scene in a reasonable officer's shoes, not, you know, um, with knowledge you have six months down the road and something gets to court. And um, basically what Graham versus Connor is, it, it paints a picture of if it's something a reasonable officer would do on scene in that situation with the information they had at that time is that's the standard that we're judged by. So, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff where they'll have stuff on during DT instructor school, we'll watch probably hundreds of videos and they'll say, what about this, what about that, what do you think about this, what do you think about that? And it all comes down to basically, not what I would do, not what the chief would necessarily do, but you know, uh, a reasonable officer's perspective. So if something might frighten a reasonable officer that wouldn't frighten another officer, that doesn't really matter. It's, it's you know, a uh, pretty open standard and uh, from what I recall of the case and what I've been taught on it, you know, there was a diabetic issue. Officers didn't realize this was a diabetic issue. A guy ran into a convenience store, tried to get an orange juice, came back out. Uh, cop saw it, thought it, perhaps he had robbed the store or something, pulled him over. By this time, the guy was going through some diabetic issue, couldn't really communicate all that effectively. The guys, uh, the officers on the scene thought he was drunk. Um, 
the long story short is there was a use of force used. He ended up getting injured in the process. Didn't immediately receive medical attention for his diabetic issue. And from what I understand, when they dumbed down the, the entire case to the point where it made sense for you know the nuts and bolts of you know teaching DT, it was the courts pretty much said you were almost there with this entire scene. Um, but regardless of how that case was decided, they came out with that standard that you know we, we can't judge it based on now we know this man has diabetes. Now we know why you can't rushing in the store, rushing out. Um, it's basically putting yourself in the officer's shoes. So it's probably something to what Officer Sherrick was alluding to when he said you can't really argue with a police officer's perspective. Um, obviously, if somebody's perspective goes beyond that reasonable officer on scenes um, standard, that's something that can be questioned. But uh, to, to, to put yourself inside that officer's perspective is a little hard for anybody to do. So. That's probably where but, he was. Uh, if I might, so is that standard of reasonableness determined by the courts? Yours, that yeah, happens? Grant versus so Connor's kind of the gold standard. I'll, I'll just give you a couple of just sites like here. Mm -hmm. yeah, the question is what is the objective test? The court stated the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable outcome on the scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. The objective test requires the court to envision a reasonable officer to ask this question based on the totality of the facts and the circumstances that such an officer believe that that force is reasonable. Facts make force reasonable. The objective reasonableness test requires officers to rely on their senses or what they saw, heard, smelled, tasted, or touched that articulate a factual basis for the seizure. The standard is was the seizure reasonable, meaning reasonable at its inception and the degree of force in its duration and in the officer's perception. I think when we did this in October, you brought us the Rodney King case, and I mentioned it as a quote. And I don't have the exact thing, but the federal lawsuit that was really all predicated on the final three blows. There's 20 some odd blows delivered by the officers of Rodney King struggling in their system. Those are all determined to be reasonable. So when he finally gave up the fight, one officer fired, uh, not fired, but I would kick them or punch them three more times. That was the unreasonable use of force that the federal law system. So it's, I mean, it's walking the fine line. Judges, all other kinds of cases, I'll refer back to Graham. Uh, Is that Graham v. Connor? What's the year of that? U.S. Supreme Court, 
on the African American suspect that they do white. So it talks about, and we're still, I'm looking at some of this inherent, implicit racial bias that, are, that everybody has. And how do you train that out of police officers? We can, a lot of the coursework we've done is, you know, trying to teach sensitivity, and then they find that the sensitivity works for about 30 to 60 days, and its effect wears off in the officer's mind. Uh, so there's more hidden things in, in the psyche that needs to be addressed that. And a lot of scholars and international chiefs of police are looking at how can we you know, peel that onion and get to the point where we can prevent implicit bias. And it's not just in white officers, it's in officers of all ethnicity and all race. So difficult thing to grab. But the reasonable, reasonable standard has been upheld for years and years and years. And, uh, and did you say 84 or 87? I thought it was 64. Oh, well, I'm looking at it. Now. Oh, that's just another case. Yeah, there's some great. Okay. But we're taking time away from the presentation like you asked for. Well, they told you you wanted 30 minutes. So this is police, police academy presentations. Yeah, or just like if a brand new recruit, the first time they sat down to get this, would be getting eight hours, and then that's added on to over eight hours of training. The CPA, we crush it down into about three hours, and I, I'm at about 26 minutes <laughs> as we go here. so. Um, you can ask whatever questions we can. I'll try to skip over some Good stuff, time. and we'll go to, go. Well, just while I'm on it, I might demonstrate this up along the way. The red gun is completely inert unless I drop it on your foot or something like that. It's not going to hurt anybody. This is an inert OC spray. I won't spray to anybody, but just so you know, it's not my OC spray. This is a real baton, but I don't plan on actually hitting anybody with it or anything like that. Um, so this this is response to resistance. Um, some people still to refer to it as use of force. Um, so the first thing is, you know, why do we train this? Why do we drill this into our people? Um, why is this something you constantly do? It's because you can't, it's not like a law where if someone's doing something crazy on Main Street, generally we can arrest them for something or another that fits the elements. And then when we get back to the station, we can see what the umbrella of what they did also fell into. There's usually an arrestable offense. We know well enough that that guy is fill in the blank and probably some other stuff, but we'll figure out the other stuff after. Um, use of force, unfortunately, you can't fill in the blanks after it happens. There's charts that show where you can strike someone with a baton. You can't pull out the chart in the middle of a you know, brawl and decide, oh, well, I'm gonna three to the green, three to the yellow, three to the red. It doesn't work that way. Um, so some of these videos, um, they're all pretty quick videos. Some of these, they're all pulled off of YouTube and other sources, so um, there is some stuff in there that I have no control over, some, some words and stuff. Um, some of them are nice to watch, um, but they do effectively show um, the different levels we're gonna be going over tonight. And uh, um, this first one just shows why you wanna make sure that your training is uh, pretty consistent in use of force across the board. Do you have? Um, I need to minimize this to get the right volume here. Is that what you're asking me about? Yeah. Let me just get the audio. So this first video is a reserve deputy uh, down south. So a reserve deputy is a lot like part-time officer in a hill town up here, comparatively. A reserve program, he has very little uh, um, bare minimum for training. That's as loud as we're going to be able to get with that. Huh? I think so. All right, well, the subtitles will pretty much show it to you, but to give you the quick catch up is uh, Brennan is a Vietnam veteran. Um, the deputy, the reserve deputy works part time, shift or two a week. Um, he gets him out, he starts making some, um, you know, not so normal comments, won't get in the car, won't follow the information, won't follow the instructions the officer's giving. We're going to notice a lot of the stuff the officer's giving are the same things over and over again. He's kind of gotten into what we call his OODA loop. 
So he's got into his thought process. He's saying, get back, get back, get back. You'll see him get into the truck. And when he really wants him to get away from the truck, he's just keeps yelling, get back, get back, get back. Um, he kind of got into his thought process here. So he goes in, he produces a knife. The officer is continuing to give him the same orders over and over again with no effect. Eventually pulls out an M1 carbine, which is a uh, Korean War era assault rifle. Loads a magazine into it. At this point, um, you know, each officer needs to make up their own individual minds, but you have somebody who's been acting erratically, loading a rifle, pointing in your direction. Um, you're at the good shoot scenario all day long here. So now that they're beginning to fire, you know, Brennan has definitely had some military training. He shoots on the move, he reloads on the move. Moving and shooting, suppress it, fire to get a better position. So the deputy's been shot at this point. Brandon does take one in the stomach during the exchange of gunfire, but you'll see he's reloading behind cover because the deputy's down by the front driver's side quarter. Then he moves in. So, all that's left to hear on this is some agonal breathing. The deputy doesn't make it. Um, Brennan does eventually get captured. Um, but what this goes to show is the biggest thing that that one should illustrate to you is that, um, have you ever heard of this concept called the OODA loop? Korean War fighter pilot came up with it, basically to say it's decision making in a combat environment. Someone needs to observe, they need to orient, they need to decide, and they need to act in order to take any kind of action. So fighter pilots train that if you can get into the OODA loop, of the other fighter, they're never gonna be able to get their composure to see what's going on, realize what they need to do, and effectively engage. That's basically what happened here in this scenario. You're gonna see, like the guy kept repeating commands that didn't even make sense. He was averting his training. If your training is simply get back, get back, get back, and the guy always gets back, and that's what works, or get out of the car. You'll see it on DT days. Not a lot of scenarios where people yell, get back in the car, get back in the car. Car won't even still be out of the picture, not even part of the scenario anymore. Guys are just used to screaming, get back in the car, and that puts an end to the scenario. So they start yelling it, and that's the kind of things that kind of happen. Yes? At what point did, did the officer start shooting? I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. It was after, it's hard to tell from the video, but from what I've seen and what I've seen on the, um, if you look at the pickup in the rear window, it looks like after Brennan's already engaging him is when he finally starts to shoot. If someone's has a rifle and you got a handgun, um, that's, that you've waited far too long. I mean, that was a, uh, in all these videos, um, you know, it is what it is. We use it for training purposes. It's horrible things that happen in them, but it, it serves a purpose to illustrate what we need and it's valuable for a training tool. So when I say, you know, his training, we, we need something, left something to be desired. It's not because I'm like, you know, dogging on the guy. It's because it, it did and, you know, there's something to be learned. How did that happen to be videoed? Is it, was it just there was Cruiser a camera. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so this is the use of force continuum. So what we do with this, you're probably familiar with this, I've seen it in other presentations, but each one of those levels in there is, um, corresponds to a different threat perception level, um, different regional officer um, responses and suspect actions. We'll go through it more in a minute. But the biggest things with this is you've got the scales, so you always want them to be equal. That means that we're applying the right amount of force and you see these lines going up and down. Those lines going up and down signify that it's uh, dynamic, it's always moving. So we can go from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top at any given moment. It doesn't necessarily go one, two, three, four, <coughs> two, two, two. So you see in here, um, level one is strategic. So basically that's the level that we operate as police officers. When I come to work in the morning, I'm driving a cruiser, I pin on a badge, I go out in the public eye. As we've seen on the West Coast in the past couple of years, that's enough to get you shot. Um, you can just be having coffee, writing reports, sitting in your cruiser, and there are certain people out there just because you're a cop will come up and execute you. 
there's not a lot, not a lot you can do about that situation. Um, you can't always be on a 360 degree alert for something like that to happen if someone chooses to do that. Luck is probably your best, you know, way to uh, deal with that. But strategic level is just taking that in mind. So a lot of times you see cops out in or out to dinner, they're usually sitting with their back um, so that they're not their back and facing towards the door. Uh, if you ever see cops they like to hang out against walls and corners, they like to be able to see what's going on. Um, you'll see cops just standing there, usually don't have their hands in their pockets, just eat into you, which is training. Um, so that's just the level you operate when you come to work. The next uh, level up is called your tactical level. So this means we're going to be affecting some type of police activity. Maybe it's a motor vehicle stop, maybe we're going to go serve some paperwork. We're doing something that's more than us just being around in a uniform. So at this level, you're employing things like when you stop a car, you want to make sure you've got a good landmark. So if you're out on uh, North Farms Road, you're going to want a nice, good landmark. You want to say, I'm three quarters of the way down North Farms Road. You want something that's going to be able to let other officers know where exactly you are. Um, it's positioning your cruiser so that when you get out, you've got that lane of travel where cars can't just come and pick you off. That's your tactical level of training. At this level, the thing we deal with is um, passive resistance. So passive resistance is someone who's resisting, but they're basically just not going to the program. The best way I can describe this is like dying protesters. They just die in and we go and we say, hey, you're under arrest and they don't fight with us, but they don't really get up and march into the bus either. We have to pick them up, we have to move them. We have to do different things. Um, these level is where you use um, contact controls. So we're picking them up, we might be moving them, we might put them in an escort. We're not inflicting pain, but we're guiding them where we need them to go. Um, the next step up from this is active resistance, the volatile. Um, and this is where compliance techniques come in. This is where people start to take up, stand up and take notice, because this is where we can use pain compliance to make someone go along with the program. So active resistance can be any physical or mechanical means. So a guy in a bar has a warrant or you know, staff wants him out and he grabs on the counter, he grabs on a pole and like, I'm not going, I'm not, I'm not leaving. Well, that's mechanical and physical resistance. We can use pain compliance to make that person um, you know, go with the program. That can be something a little as, you know, extended portion of the baton on a pressure point on the wrist. Just a quick little, hey buddy, let's go. Ah, oh, that really hurts. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Enough to gain control of the situation, get them out. This also includes OC spray. So OC spray, um, we'll get into it a little bit more later, but hot pepper spray, you spray it, the whole idea is to distract someone long enough that we can get control and get them in handcuffs, get them out of the, out of the situation. Um, so that's what level you're at with active resistance. So active resistance is where that passive guy goes from where you grab on an escort and he just kind of goes with the flow and he pulls away. And he pulls away, he's active resistance. He's engaged some type of active resistance to what we're trying to do. The next step up is uh, harmful. That's your threat perception category. So this is assault and bodily harm. So this is where that pulling away turns to trying to punch the cop, shoving the cop, trying to physically hurt a cop, someone else. We can run up on a, on a fight between two other people. If they're engaged in mutual combat, they're at a harmful level. Um, so at this point, we can use um, defensive tactics. So this includes um, hand techniques, punches, knee strikes, um, and you can also use some of these knee strikes and things depending on the uh, amount of speed and uh, uh, effort put into it as compliance techniques. So we can do a strike with the knee to the nerve in the side of your leg. That's not a strike to like physically injure you. That's a strike to go ah, and then we can get your hands behind your back. We can do things. That's a lot of things someone will often do. Go down, clench your hands in front of them. We're trying to get their hands out, trying to get their hands out. And you need something to kind of break their concentration to get the upper hand. Um, but yeah, so closed hand techniques, <coughs> punches, palm heel strikes. This is also where the baton can come into play. So you have a baton, that's when you'll see cops who are up on the outside of the arm carry, strikes you deliver the baton. A baton can also be used quite a few ways, as I showed like the pressure points for uh, control techniques where just because the baton comes out doesn't mean that we're gonna use it on an assaulted person, we can use it on an active resistant person. Um, and then the top level, everybody pretty much gets this one. This is where the littlest question is most times. This is your lethal level. So at lethal, this is, you know, guy with a knife, guy with a gun. Um, but it can also get to, you know, shades of gray when you get into guys 
on top of a cop. He's an MMA guy. He's under this whole tap out shirt. Uh, you know, uh, 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 choking people out. Maybe he's punching a cop in the head, and the cop's head's bouncing off the concrete. That's effectively if you could pick up a piece of concrete and bounce it off the cop's head. That's pretty much the same thing you're doing. So, um, in that case, you know, lethal force very well could be completely justified. So, yes. Is there a, a specific point in the model where it's justified for the for the, the, where this department has protocol around drawing a gun? Well, that's that's one thing that this middle column um, actually kind of covers. So this is all, you know, like what the bad guy's doing, and this is what the cop, a reasonable officer, would do. But this area right here is your threat perception category. So this can kind of up the ante because um, this is, as Officer Sheriff, <coughs> your perception. Now, if we get a call for shots fired, or a lot of times people call them fireworks, or they don't know what it is, maybe gunshots, and we get there, and it's in the same neighborhood, we know it's the kids, they shoot these things off, we never catch them, we get there, it's still the sulfur's still hanging in the sky. That's a lot different than we get a call to maybe Salvo House for the stairwell gunshots, and we get there and you can smell cordite in the air, you can smell gunpowder in the air. Just because we don't see a guy with a gun doesn't mean we're gonna wait for somebody to point one at us before we have our guns out and ready. Um, so there's many different things. You have a uh, felony motor vehicle stop. We just had some kind of crazy pursuit through town, something crazy happened. Um, there's no black and white line when officers are able to pull their weapons out. However, it is considered a use of force and it has to be documented. So if an officer pulls out the weapon, they do a use of force report form. It gets reviewed by their supervisor, it goes to a defensive tactic instructor, it goes to the training coordinator, the captain of operations, and uh, the chief has access to review those at any time. So, and just, because I think some people are confused, you unholster a weapon, there's essentially several levels of what you do. The, the ready? Yes. Yeah, there's, there's low ready, uh, which is basically weapons holster. And the, thing, the other thing that a patrol duty holster has quite a few steps to get the weapon out. I mean, we do train to draw it pretty efficiently, but if you think you're going to need it, you don't want to be engaging six or seven different things to do to get it out when you might need it at a moment's notice. But one thing you'll notice officers are trained to do is have a high index on the weapon. So you can see that the index finger is going to be up towards as high as it can reach on the top of that slide. That's to prevent sympathetic discharge. So you're going in, something happens, a lot of noise, you tense up, or you grab on something with this hand, and the natural reaction is that this hand tenses up as well. You have a low ready, so this is pretty much the weapon's out. It's ready within a couple of, you know, it can come up, uh, present on target. Uh, you have the ready position. Uh, there's there's several different ways. Um, and then, you know, sometimes people, officers might actually have their weapons drawn, but kind of in an out of sight way, so they're not, you know, drawing a lot of attention to the fact that it's there, but it's, it's ready. Um, you have a lot of these, like, you know, suicide by cop scenarios, you're gonna have lethal backup. You have less lethal weapons out there, and there might be an officer who's standing by with lethal backup, just not making it, you know, painfully obvious to everybody, not escalate the situation. But every situation is going to kind of play itself out, and we don't paint anybody into like a box of this is when you can, this is when you can't, based off that same reasonable standard, because there's no way. Um, a lot of times, these things, especially at recruit level, all of the questions start to get asked, and it gets to a level of like, you know if grasshoppers had machine guns, would birds still mess with them? Because they're trying to get an answer for every possible scenario on Earth, and we can't, there's no way we can say, like, yes, no, sure, that time I'd say it was great. It's, 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 it's all based on a reasonable standard. And if we see something come up where we're like, hmm, a lot of times we'll talk to the officer, and just talking to them is perfectly justified. It's just the verbiage in the report didn't reflect the whole <coughs> picture, you know? So it's, it's, there's no, to answer your question, there's no thing where we say you can, you can't, but it comes into this, this threat perception category and it's up to the officer's perception. You just had an incident the, uh, downtown. Oh yeah, two. I two, mean, well, the, the, the one. Because that says officers draw a weapon on person. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, the, well, they went for that from the report. The suicide by cop guy. Right. The, the, some one officer was there. sneaking up unbeknownst to the guy, because we knew we were getting a ping from a phone somewhere in that block. No description. Talking about killing himself. Taking out a cop. So we got one guy go, he got around by the bus stop. And as soon as the guy made him, he reached in the back of his jacket. So one of the other officers drew and pointed 
and our, our support support form also differentiates between point and aim at a human or ready carry and an holster because that perception was holy shit you know said he had a gun he's going to use it and then they were able to and again when you're drawing a weapon and you're alone it's a whole different set of rules than if you've got a contact and a cover officer so in this case that one officer covered the other officer made contact then they got a struggle and then the officer reholds the other one was a car that was back in bazaar with antique plates on it just a crazy situation wouldn't stop wouldn't stop slow speed not high speed pursuit parks in a remote area won't get out of the car after being addressed so they as the paper said the officers drew guns on them well they tactically unholstered their weapon and approached the vehicle until they could figure out what was going on to get in fires so it's not always they drew their gun so that's what the media well you know it's actually in both those well one was the Gazette article one was a public article with the both cases, it was the it was essentially noted the remarkable restraint, given the circumstances, given what what the public perception is, is that once a gun's unholstered, it's discharged and someone's dead. And they have a propensity to report an eyewitness report without actually calling us to confirm <coughs> the factual circumstances. In this day and age, when you put something online, they haven't even talked to us yet to confirm it. Journalism 101: confirm your sources. You know, so when that popped up, we were like, "Whoa, whoa, what's going on?" That's not what happened. But I digress. But, that, that, but essentially, those two scenarios are sort of what you're describing. Oh yeah. And, uh, you, you, yeah. You, your threat perception can be through the roof when, in actuality, until you figure out what's going on, you may be at a down low thing. But you know, uh, officers are trained to keep their finger off the trigger, like. Yeah, when bad, crazy things happen, like every once in a while, someone's gonna have a weapon pointed at them, and it, it, it'll be all right, and, you know. Like, but we need to figure out what's going on, and it's a little too late to, you know, be approaching someone with an edge weapon, somebody you think has a firearm, and, and this stuff happens very fast, you know. And, and as the chief said, once they figure out what's going on, you reholster the weapon, and that's like those lines that go up and down the continuum show. Like this can go from up here and down and right back up again. So. Drill the firearms training, gun OC, yeah, choices. You want to be ready, you don't want to be fumbling for it, or use your baton and the guy keeps coming. So you have one hand for less lethal, one hand lethal. So this just shows passive resistance. This is, you know, the protester. They're just going along for the ride. Um, I will say one thing on passive resistance. As I mentioned, active resistance includes mechanical means so like these contraptions people are putting themselves into and things like that the handcuff uh, th that's using mechanical means the problem with that is also if they've incorporated some kind of thing and we don't know what's going on like pain compliance if they can't get themselves out of it isn't going to get us anywhere it's you know they're going to ow but they can't it's not going if they could get up and walk away that'd be great but so but there are ways like if someone's using some kind of mechanical means that um, you are uh, okay using Pain compliance. Now, active resistance, this video's, uh, I think, Oklahoma, but anyway, they're using a taser in this video. I just want to point out that most departments in Massachusetts would not use a taser in this manner on an active resistance suspect. Some could, it's up to your policy, but um, just keep that in mind as you watch this. But basically, I want to show you is that active resistance is just that constant resistance, resistance. And at the end of the video, you actually hear the cop saying he's under arrest for resisting arrest it gets a little shady when he goes off camera you can't tell if the guy's being assaulted and it's really a hard thing to determine whether you know you're struggling with somebody their fists are clenched and when that you know enthusiasm is going from running away to shoving the officer and, and becoming assaulted these aren't my comments
sky is the term of the So he goes in after this and pretty much cuffs him without incident. Tells him what the charges are. But that active resistance, he's just not going to program. He's not trying to punch the cop's face in, but he's trying to get away. He's going to get in his car. He's going to leave. You're not arresting me. You're not doing this. And I was actually on the border about this one, because especially when they come out of the view of the car, like it looks like his arms are kind of swinging. But the cop pretty, it says right at the end, like, you're under arrest for OUI, this and that. Uh, resisting arrest. He never mentions A and B on a PO or whatever the you know charge out there would be. So that's why this one, like you know, right on the border, it's really in the perception of the officer and like what's going on and like what he thinks this guy's intent is. But even when you see him kind of get away and start to walk off, he doesn't have his fist clenched up. He's kind of like the whole like even his body language is kind of like he just wants out of there. And what's the effect of the taser? on the individual gun, I mean, when he says he can't put his arms behind his back because he's been... That, the tasers, once you've been shocked, uh, Pete Sherrick's a, or was a taser instructor, he'll tell you it was the worst five seconds of pain in his entire life, but it's almost instant recovery. So once you, you're you done being shocked by it, it's it's over. Um, I've heard it described as like being hit in the back with a sledgehammer by King Kong for five seconds, and it's over. The thing that, like, a lot of places and officers say that's nice about a taser paired to OC is you hit someone with OC and a decon can take an hour. It, people just, you can't even book them. They're like, oh, it's burning. You wash them, they go to the hospital, they come back, they're still just not, especially they've never experienced it. Like, you can take people a lot to like get over that. This, I, I, I haven't been tased, but apparently it's not a lot of fun for five seconds and then it's over. Um, you remove two parts and they're on their way, um, but um, there's other things that come into play with, you know, tasers and carrying them and where they lay on different departments. So, I, but the question was, so that claim that I can't put yeah, my arms. That's, that's highly back. unlikely. I mean, he's pretty well intoxicated. It's looking like from the video, he didn't want to go along with the program from from the beginning. Um, as far as him not being able to put his hands behind his back, that's that's from everything I've I've seen. I've watched a video of probably four or six people being tased and in like, you know, uh, real world situations and training situations. I've never heard someone say they couldn't move a part of their body after being tased, so. Um, this is assaultive, um, so this is pretty clear. This is in Boston. It is a MBTA sergeant. And uh, you'll see that they get into a brawl and a lot of people walk by, take notice, um, First guy to end up helping is a uh, World War II era vet, maybe, was the first guy who decided to run up and actually do something. I mean, if people don't want to get involved, that's completely their choice. You know, we don't want people getting hurt, but, you know. Even the person filming could probably put their phone to better use by calling the police with it. Then. <laughs> now, if you encounter a situation where officers one-on-one -on -one appears to be struggling, how would you communicate to the officer, do you need help? Because you just don't want to join well, in. No, I, mean, I think I think the chief <clears throat> even brought up during an uh, incident we had a couple of years ago that there's an incident where a cop got his nose broken running into a uh, incident in plain clothes. Like you definitely want to make your intentions known, and you know we don't want to encourage people to get themselves in a situation that they're not comfortable being into, or they're going to get hurt, or the cops not going to know what what's going on. But you know, uh, a phone call is better than 
than nothing was probably the best way I would. Oh, if you're on, if that. you're there, you're saying, it looks like this guy can tell. Yeah. How do you address? You know, what do you say? If, when, if you were gonna jump into the mix, I would make sure that the officer knows what your intentions, intentions are. Well, certainly, I'm a friendly work that you will. Uh, you should you should ask that or you could ask that. You should. Oh, yeah. yeah, could Rather you know, just call the police and call oh, call first. Well, yeah, but you know if it seems to be so going these poorly. Are, these are all citizens. Yeah. Who come, who come over there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But I would assume and, you want to tell the officer what your intentions yeah. are. You just, you just don't want. You just don't want. I love your help. Run you know. in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, in an interview, this sergeant actually says that he uh, when he got tangled up. He's actually had the guy kind of tangled up. He looked over and there was a group of people over there. And he was like, if you want to help, like, by all means. And they all came in and kind of gave him a hand. Okay. Yeah, I mean, years ago, working on the bed, truck pulled or something. We had four guys fighting. Three of them turned on me. I got two of them down on the ground. We had another one on the table. And all I got like, was before we had the safety holster, somebody was right there. And I just nailed it in the truck and pulled the face. Safe police major. <laughs> it broke his nose. He never told me that he was there to help with that. It was one of the other guys coming from my bed. And he afterwards was like, I'm sorry. It's like, Jesus, what right? They should have said something. I'm like, no kidding. You know, it's one out of three here. I'm losing. But. So, this video, um, serious bodily harm and or death, that was the top level. Uh, you know, simple thing is a, a handgun. Uh, you know, could be a knife. There's case law in New York with a syringe. You know, this could be any number of things. A brick, a baseball bat, you, you name it. A vehicle. Yep, it could be any number of things. This is a video. This officer's doing drug interdiction. So these guys are on like lone straights of like Route 95. They're out there doing like, you know, stopping these cars. Uh, these guys are good at what they do, but they work alone and there's not a lot of backup. So we'll kind of narrate as it goes through here. But he gets this guy to the back of the car he wants to pat him down, and just the guy's body language, you know, he's, he's kind of not going with the program, he's doing the whole hand shaking, uh, the pee pee dance with the feet, like, you know, jittery, something's up here. So at some point, the officer's going to move in here and try to pat him down, and he sees a handgun in his waistband. So now the fight's on. Anyone here ever done any wrestling, MMA, ground fighting, anything like that? Wrestling, not MMA. No. Now, but you would know that being tangled up with somebody right now, he's expending huge amounts of energy. Um, this guy's actually doing a really good job of using his body weight as leverage and not expending all his energy in the first 30 seconds, which is a good way, especially now with all these guys who are studying MMA. If you burn yourself out in the first 30 seconds, you're, you're done. Like these guys train, but like, if they want to bring a cop to the ground, they know how to be on the ground probably better than the cop. And there's gyms dedicated to this. We've got gyms here in town that do this stuff. So the cop and this guy have been going at it for quite a while now. They're fighting for the gun that's underneath the guy. Now eventually the officer realizes he's run out of steam. Gives him a couple of softening blows. softening blows, draws his weapon, went around the back of the head. Now it's kind of funny because the beginning of this, when we do, just kicked away. Yep. Yeah. in the beginning of this, uh, when we do this to the CPA, we'll show this video at the beginning and people will be half and half decided whether that was a good shoot or not. When there's a cop, they've been fighting, they're fighting over a gun, the guy's reaching for a gun, like what, is, what do people think his intent is if it's all that weapon, you know? I think it's a hand it to the officer and say, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we're going to be on our way here. Um, he followed him for a good, a good, you know, minute. Um, and ground fighting like that, we've got some stuff coming of that. You would spend huge amounts of energy. At the end of that, like, once your adrenaline is gone out of your body, you're going to be like a jellyfish after a fight like that. And uh, um, so that's a good video for assaultive bodily harm. Um, so let's look at this as far as uh, use of force. This guy's got a knife.
The rule is the 21 foot rule in a minute. Oh. So what do we think of that? I, I didn't really see the, I didn't even really see much of the knife or what he was doing with it. He's got a knife in his hand, it's pretty big, he's waving it around. I don't know what called them here, but obviously there's enough cops there. He's done something that drew this much attention to him. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's kind of a misnomer when they say the 21 foot rule, but basically the FBI did a study years and years and years ago. They put two cops back to back. And these are like academy level, like PT studs, like, you know, rare to go guys. And without even looking at each other, they blew a whistle. One guy ran, one guy drew his weapon. And they measured how long it took that guy to run before this guy got his weapon out and was able to present the weapon and get a round off. 21 feet. So basically what that says, if the perfect scenario, 21 foot rule is what they came up with. If a guy presents with an edge weapon, he can close the distance of 21 feet and stab you with it before you can get your gun out and you can put around in him and stop the threat. Now, you talk about the 21 foot rule, a lot of people get confused and think there's just a guy with a knife 21 feet away and you, know, you can engage. That's not necessarily true. Like There needs to be some overt action, something that's saying this guy is about to you know, come and attack me with his knife. However, the 21 foot rule should be expanded because they never took into consideration that this guy isn't looking at the stimulus of a guy with a knife running at him, one, it's a completely like stress-free, he's just drawing, this guy's closing a distance, that adds a whole other dynamic to this situation. So that guy was well within 21 feet of many of those police officers. I'm surprised there was the one officer who got within, looked to be eight feet of him, had his finger out, like, you put down that knife, like, that's just asking to get, you know, sliced to pieces. Um, we'll have some stuff that comes up a little bit further on is why you don't want to mess around with edge weapons. Edge weapons, are a very bad threat. If you talk to a lot of guys who are big into MMA, Krav Maga instructors, guys who just love to like tussle with people and fight, they would rather fight with somebody with a handgun in close quarters than they would with a hand with a knife. Because the knife is always loaded and the knife will always stab you, nick you, puncture you, where the gun takes some kind of manual manipulation and people who know what they're doing can actually take a gun out of a fight if you're in close quarters by mechanical means. <coughs> so yeah, um, He's out, he's waving a knife around. He's well within, I don't know what led up to this. Were there, were there guns drawn? Oh yeah, there was guns drawn. There was a couple of cops that had their guns, didn't have their guns out. And I don't know if they were trying to do like contact cover or whatever, but that guy was right in this guy's face, like just asking for something terrible to happen. Um, and uh, you know, we have things like the 40 millimeter, which are a nice way to bridge the gap in between lethal force and less lethal force. I don't think they had it, judging by the means they used, but the guy got up and was good enough to throw down the knife, put up his hands, and get brought away. Um, I think a 40 caliber hollow hit. point. What's that? You mean after he was hit? Yes. I mean, the, the, the other choice those officers had would have been to use deadly force. Probably would have, you know, I'm not saying he came away great from being crushed into a parking meter, but considering what they had for options, um, they made it work, and the guy probably is better off than he would have been with a couple of duty rounds in him, so. And a situation like that, I mean, does that make a case for why you, why tasers are useful? Because there was enough guys around that somebody was on his blind side. Oh, right. there's 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 plenty of things for all different like types of less lethal. There's a world of different less lethal <clears throat> stuff. We'll go over some of the options we have that we actually got in response to a lot of suicide by cop things you're going to, and you get four handguns out there and you're giving orders, and the guy doesn't want to respond to the orders, then you don't have a lot of choice in what you're doing. We have one tool. And, you know, if he isn't doing it, you end up in a standoff that is just asking for, you know, a bad situation. Um, so edge weapons. This guy here is a cop, uh, DT instructor, martial arts expert. There was a kid, I believe it was an 11 year old with a knife. And he thought that he could disarm this kid because of his martial arts prowess and um, the fact that it was a kid. Uh, when we do edge weapon defense, one of the things you'll actually do is wrap up the arm and your back is exposed to that edge weapon. So this guy probably did exactly what he was trained, but the thing about fighting with edge weapons are you're going to get cut in a knife fight. Like it's not if um, the guys who really get into knife fighting actually offer up parts of their body that are expendable to be cut while they attack. 
more vulnerable areas of their opponent. So what I'm, this video I'm about to show you is a fight for life seminar that me and Officer Sherrick went to. Basically the scenario is, and these are all COs, cops, veteran guys, DT instructors, so these are well trained veteran officers. The situation is you know this guy has a shop knife. This is a knife that, it's like a stun gun. They pull it out, it goes zzzz, and then it hits your body. It feels like, it's supposed to simulate you being slashed by a knife. But in anything, it's scary. You pull the thing, and it, you know it's gonna hurt. Like you have some of that like, oh no reaction to it. So all you have to do in this scenario is draw your weapon presented at the suspect when the scenario stops. And you know going into this that at some point this guy is going to draw this shock knife out. So you know it's a shock knife, you know it's not going to kill you. You know that it's going to happen and you're a fully trained officer expecting it to happen. And just watch the, this is a pretty good typical reaction to it. So this guy kind of went above and beyond and kept shocking his partner after he had the red gun out. But <clears throat> the point is knowing that that was going to happen and preparing yourself for that was going to happen, you still can see how quickly things can go south. Um, and in this case, yeah, you got zapped a few times, but if that was an edge weapon, you know, this is what you're looking at. So video, everyone likes to watch the videos and make decisions based on police dash cam videos. So you're gonna see this cruiser enter gas station parking lot. And you're going to see some people walk into view. I just want you to watch what goes down in your immediate thoughts and keep in your mind immediate thoughts of, you know, if you saw this on the six o'clock news, what you would uh, say, what you would be thinking. How's that look on six o'clock news? They're, they're chasing him down, he seems to be just kind of walking away. Wouldn't look great, right? You'd yeah. probably be like, whoa, what's going on there? You shot that guy in the back. Was that, was that a, a gun? Or yeah. was that a... No, it was a gun. He was, he was shooting him as he was walking away. Yeah. So that's the first video. This is the second camera. This car doesn't have any audio. told it was was a metallic cell phone and then what I was later told was that back when this video was in and like Nokia's had like those brick like cell phones and all that they have a cell phone looking gun that can actually shoot a 22 caliber shell out of where the antenna would be uh, you'll see in the video that he turns quickly you'll see some type of commotion the officer ducks and that's when the second officer opens up um, yeah so this is just a good thing of, you can never take just a, a, a single, you know, two-dimensional video and, and assume that it's showing you everything. I mean, I've had classes where they see that first video and they're like, those guys are out of their minds. Like, what are they doing? Like, they shot that guy? Did, like, they shot him in the back? And um, another key thing to remember is they've done studies and it's possible for someone to be presenting a weapon. And in the time it takes for the officer to make the decision to draw his weapon, present his weapon, shoot his weapon, they can be turned around 180 degrees and catch around in the back before the officer can even make a conscious decision to shut down that, that action that's about to happen. Um, the stuff, you know, unfortunately doesn't get to get practiced with uh, paintballs and... and that was real justifiable. Oh, yeah. And what was the thing? Was it a, was it a cell phone or was it a gun? 
it was a cell phone gun from it what was I'm told. But gun. really, it doesn't it doesn't matter what it was. The way he was posturing with the metallic right. weapon, the way he right. turned uh, the officers like that, like he wanted them to think he had a gun, whether he had one or didn't. It right. really. What were they responding to? I, I don't know what they were responding. To. A lot of these videos, we don't get the whole. Pursuit. <coughs> yeah. I know. I, I know. We knew what crime he was in. Were they what he just committed before? Oh. Yeah, I don't know the background of this. Um, this next one here, this one's difficult to watch. Um, this is down to Texas. I've seen it. So he stops this motor vehicle. 72 year old Melvin Hale thinks he's being carjacked. It's a semi marked cruiser. So, like our supervisor's car where there's not a light bar on top. He opens up with a large caliber semi automatic rifle. Officer's out right now. He's alive, uh, at least in the technical sense. But he's been shot in the head. Melvin Hale realizes what he's done. Gets on the trooper's cruiser radio. Calls in what happened. You'll hear him say, I just shot a highway patrolman. You hear the agonal breathing of the trooper. This is a regular police cruiser? It's a semi mark So like our supervisor's car, it's got the markings on the side, it's got lights and dash, it just doesn't have a bubble on top. So he was took it from... He a thought it was a car jack. Because of that? Yeah. And why was he being pulled over? He died in the body, he put in violation or something. There was no like serious... But how did you pull over? He didn't have lights. No, he's got like our cruise, our supervisor car has lights on the grill. It has lights up in the window. It just doesn't have a light. A typical. He thought that it was a car. Apparently, there was a carjacking that occurred. So he just assumed that this doesn't look like an ordinary police car. It must not be a cop. And you know, in Texas, people love guns. And yeah. Did the officer survive? But. The reasons why, well, potential reasons why he didn't survive will be shown to you in the moment here. So they're figuring out where he is. This guy is saying, I shot a high patrolman. He's given his location. They clear the channel. They hear him towing out ambulances, sending every cop that's anywhere around there. there. They get sent to an officer down call. The responding officers are pulling up and they're seeing a cruiser with bullet holes through the windshield. You know, kind of obvious that there's a car stop here. And Melvin Hale's walking around with a rifle. Okay, it gets worse. And keep in mind of all the traffic that's still flowing freely on this other side of the highway here. I mean, that rifle could probably reach out. I'm guessing it's at least a 308 caliber. And, you know, that thing could reach out a thousand yards and still be lethal beyond that, but I don't know how accurate it would be. So now cops have been on scene. This guy's going to exit his car and doesn't have his weapon out. Melvin Hale's walked around with a rifle after some unknown person just called him with a shot higher patrol. Trooper said read at this point. Still walk around with a rifle. They're they're entering negotiations, but I mean, these this 
this is a kind of a dynamic situation. I mean, do, do we really want this guy getting his Dodge K car and driving off in the sunset to go back to the ranch at this point? Um, that's basically what starts to happen. And the other thing you have to realize and keep in mind is while we're negotiating with the guy who already kind of obviously shot the cop, waving a rifle around on the side of the highway as concerned citizens are driving by within range, the cop's still dying inside of this cruiser. It seemed like a person made a mistake, but now he's just like... He, he thinks that by, basically what I've been told is he thinks by calling it in and being like, I thought the guy, he thought that was like judge trial, like, hey, I thought he was, it wasn't a cop, but shot him, I'm, I'm headed out, so yeah, I'm out. Um, I mean. He wants to leave. Yeah, oh yeah, he gets in the car and starts to drive away. So, you'll hear him start to engage in some, so you're not going to leave the area, you need to come back here. Uh, you know, there's times for negotiations. Um, you know, you want to preserve life whenever possible. But, you know, you don't know the status of the trooper. There's still civilian traffic coming out on this side. He's still running around with a high-powered rifle. What year is this? Uh, So here, there's an officer on the PA now, giving him some commands. Nice weapon down, place a weapon down. One thing we teach everyone, and obviously it's going to depend on the situation, is that a lot, officers have to really do a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to need to have a lot of stalking. Yeah, I was going to say, we're you give commands, you give commands, the commands aren't working. Like, eventually this needs to come to some type of end. Yeah, I'm surprised he's still walking around. Well, he's so now away. he's driving away. I mean, this guy shot up a cruiser, run around with a rifle, now he's going to take off into the sunset. Um, and a lot of this, you know, there's, there's a lot of theories behind this whole scene. And a lot of times you'll come up to a call so now they're finally, you know, four or five minutes into this, getting to the officer. They still haven't secured him. They just managed to get him close enough yeah, to right. you know, deal with the cop. Uh, no ambulance here. Most of the time, an ambulance going to be coming into the scene like this. They're going to the scene secure. Yeah. Yeah. You might have some tactical medics or something that would ride with a SWAT team, but yeah. you're not going to get a lot of jam in this drive into this. So that trooper died. The widow sued the uh, Department of Public Safety in Texas. I'm told that. Uh, None of the people on that scene worked in law enforcement after that incident. They were all down south, like fired for cowardice is like a pretty reasonable thing to fire people for. Um, you Why know, they you want to fired for cowardice for not going after a Melvin for not controlling the situation. And whether oh. they all faced disciplinary action and, and or some of them left or whatever, but the, what's told to us at instructor school is that nobody on this call worked in law enforcement after this all went down. Um, you know, you want to preserve life whenever possible, but you, you need to weigh, you know, the whole situation out. And this guy's erratic. He's already shot this cop. There's citizens, there's everything else. They're giving commands. And a lot of this is, they, they say, if you come on. For not, they were criticized for not taking him down. Yes. So I see. Yeah. So and we're given the, you're already biased by the fact that Rick told you that the guy was apologizing was by a mistake. Shot the guy had a mistake. If you'd watch it without that information, you wonder why the cops didn't. Oh, right. They didn't know. They didn't know that. They he didn't had. have that information. Yeah. yeah. They had no clue. And yeah. with the fact remains, shot him by mistake or not, you, you walk around with a rifle, you're not putting down. Case closed. You know. Right. 
And because yeah. you've already done it once, you could make another mistake. The, the biggest thing I like for people to take away from this is if this could happen on the side of a rural highway in Texas, how do you think police officers responding to a call on the East Coast could maybe get into a situation like this because they're wondering what kind of second guessing is going to occur if they put this guy down? You know, you shoot to stop, you stop the threat, he doesn't make it, and now it's 72 year old confused man is killed by police. This can be spun any number of ways. Um, and I'm not saying I have a perfect solution to the problem, but this, this, you know, this went down very badly. The fact that that cop sat there gurgling for four minutes, probably watching his, you know, colleagues engaging in all this. So OC spray, we went over this briefly. Scoville heat units, SHUs. One Scoville heat unit is equal to one jalapeno pepper. Our issued OC spray is two million whole Scoville heat units. So if you can intensify a jalapeno pepper times two million times, that's how hot the stuff we carry is. Um, percentages versus Scoville heat units, the higher percentage you get usually affects how long it lasts. The Scoville heat unit itself is how hot it is. So the percentage is how much of this can is, is pepper versus just carrier and then how hot that pepper is in the solar heat unit. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming in to get stuff that's hot, 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 because we wanted to have the distraction air technique, but we also wanted it to go away very quickly. If we could have a perfect OC, it would last five to 10 seconds. It would be horrific as far as the effects on you, but it would let you recover almost instantly because we only need time to go and get you in handcuffs. After that, it's nothing but a pain for us because people are, freaking out, they're saying, I'm dying, I can't breathe, you're, sir, you're talking, you can breathe, no, I'm dying, I'm dying, I can't see, it, it sucks, it sucks, we get sprayed with this stuff and they're making it hotter and hotter. They actually have a kind now that's made from wasabi, and it's green, it's called Saber, instead of this like Saber Red, they have Saber Green, and it's wasabi, and it's supposed to actually have, like, you know, when you eat wasabi, it's really hot, and then it kind of goes away pretty quick, it's supposed to be that same thing, I don't know, we'll see how it works out, but ROC is a uh, water-based uh, uh, carrier, so it is taser safe. So even though we don't have tasers, if we were working with some agency that did have them, we sprayed someone with OC, someone's not gonna hit them with a taser and they burst into flames because it's an alcohol-based carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a video of the specs of OC. I'm pretty sure everybody's seen it. There you get you know, eyes closed. The thing with OC is that it's actually an inflammatory mace. It used to be the big thing back in like the 80s. That had to, you had to be able to feel pain for mace to have an effect on you. If you didn't feel pain, the mace had no effect. OC does have no effect on like a certain part of the population. Most people has an effect on it. I can't stand it. My eyes, just, it's awesome. I can't, I, I don't like it at all. But uh, um, the good thing you know about pepper spray is it does cause an involuntary closing of the eyes. It does cause inflammatory um, um, effects on the respiratory tract. Not enough to actually shut down somebody's breathing, but even if somebody's intoxicated, for some reason they don't feel pain, OC can still have an effect where mace, maybe like spray in the face of water. If they can't feel pain, then they're not gonna have any response to it. So I'm gonna add out the expendable baton. Um, that's what we carry. Uh, you can use it for strikes, strikes, you can use it for blocks, you can use it for compliance techniques. You can use this up and down the uh, force continuum. And if you had this out and somebody drew a knife, you could go to a lethal area, like a red area, like the head, neck, spine, um, and employ lethal force with your baton rather than try to put this away and draw your weapon and, and go from there. So uh, that can be used in a lot of ways. So these are striking areas. And just be aware that every time a better option comes up, we've gone from batons to PR24s to expandable PR24s to an earlier version of this to this version. And we just tested a what the NIJ was saying the most effective baton out there, Peacekeeper Baton. It's made by this company, New Jersey. We deployed it uh, through our officers. Everybody carried it. It's just not ready for us yet. They haven't got the carrier. I got in a foot pursuit and it fell out. You know, it's really a pain to have to go search through a neighborhood to find the thing that fell off your belt while you're running after somebody. Um, and you have to bang it on the ground to close it. Um, so there was some things, and then we actually did live this baton versus that baton on strike bags. And for the amount of extra oomph we got out of it, it wasn't worth all the negatives. So we're always looking into this stuff. Um, anytime we see that something's, something's good, uh, administration's really good about letting us run T&Es. 
I read all the magazines. I'm like, hey, this thing looks like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, we'll get a few of them, try them out, see how it works out, do a report. Maybe it's a yes, maybe it's a no. Um, strike area, so this is a baton chart. So red, it, just like a traffic light. Red is no good. Yellow, you know, and depending on who you talk to, so it means floor to some people, but for us in this chart, it means that you uh, know that that's prone to higher rates of injury. And green is good to go on an assaulted person. So the other thing to consider in this is this isn't, you know, this is a dynamic situation. Your intended target is the thigh, and you end up hitting the top of the knee. You can't really fault the officer for that. You know, this guy's swinging, we're swinging, you know, stuff's going on. Uh, the big part of this chart is to make people know that, yeah, unless it's deadly force, you're not aiming for the kidneys, you're not aiming for the spine, you're not aiming for the head, you're not aiming for the solar plexus. And as I said, this baton can be used on joints and everything else at a much lower level. Right at active resistance, we can be using this baton in that manner. Handcuffs, pretty standard. These are different duty weapons. Glock 22, that's carried by the majority of the uh, line personnel. Glock 23, that's carried by some people, uh, female officers. We have some officers that are smaller in stature, smaller hands. They prefer uh, this weapon because it's a little smaller and a little easier to handle. And if you're going to do a lot of on and off duty carry, this weapon's a pretty good thing. Uh, Glock 27, this is what a lot of administrators, detectives carry. Um, it's smaller, it doesn't tear apart dress pants from carrying it, you know, day after day on dress belts and dress clothes. Uh, it weighs quite a bit less. Patrol rifles, we have Colt government carbines, uh, 556 AR-15 rifle, 30 round capacity. We actually upgraded them to have weapon mounted lights and holographic sights on them. Pepper ball launchers, so we have less lethal, so this can be employed at an active resistant. So a pepper ball gun, um, for lack of a better term, if anybody's familiar with a paintball gun, they're very similar. Pepper ball will sue you if you call it a paintball gun. So it's not a pepper ball, it's not a paintball gun, it's a pepper ball launcher. But it shoots the same caliber projectile and it is made by a paintball gun company. So that's the idea of what you're looking at. Um, they shoot a number of different rounds. What we primarily use are inner training rounds. We shoot like baby powder. Um, and it's inside of a, a hard plastic uh, fractu uh, fracturable um, ball. So it hits on impact, it breaks apart, and this dust is left in the air. Then there's the pop rounds, which are actual OC. So that's the hot uh, pepper, same stuff that's in OC spray is inside this powder. So you can use this on an active resistant crowd. So you have a crowd that just isn't going with the program. Folks, we're going to be at you know, a dispersal order. They're not leaving. Uh, you know, Move back, move back, moving towards the officers. Not quite assaulted yet. You can actually deploy this, shoot it at the ground, shoot at buildings around and let the dust come up. It's the same thing as deploying OC spray, but it's just you can do it from a distance, you can do it a little more safely. Um, you can also use it on a salted person by impacting them with the pepper, uh, the pepper balls. The pepper balls not only hit them and how that hurts, and you get the, the, the pepper ball effect on, on it as well. Where are these kept? Like it's, it's just the nurse. Yeah. Basically, in a perfect scenario, I mean, sometimes the cars go down, but we have one uptown, one downtown, one in the supervisor's car, and then um, we have a rifle in every frontline patrol car, and then we have 40 millimeters in every frontline patrol car as well. So there's stuff out there. We don't have as many of these. These are kind of getting phased out, and as they get better munitions for the 40 millimeters, we might eventually get rid of them. But for right now, they kind of fill a, a, a gap that we. And it, they're, these are actually really expensive. The, the, the rounds, because the company won't let you use like paintballs to train, which would be pennies. You have to buy these powdered filled rounds at $1.50 a piece, and it's 50 rounds qualification per officer. So you can see how quickly that adds up. Yes, there's well, better alternatives that we're looking into. And this isn't the type of round, uh, gun or let's leave the weapon that Boston used at the one that I did. Yeah. That, that, was, that was much more. That, that was a uh, FNN, I think it's called a 303. It shoots a zinc filled, like rubberized round. Like they use it like in the Balkans, so, like, like serious, like, you know, uh, rubber bullet stuff. This isn't like the uh, pepper ball gun and that thing that killed that girl in Boston, people do different things. The other thing that shot her was a weighted ball that looks like a Pac Man, like, like a ball with, a, with like an opening on it. And it's it has the velocity and the, the, the the weight behind it that it can actually penetrate an eye socket where uh, um, a pepper ball is going to be far less likely if you're even able to do that. So, so you, you said one of the things to do is they shoot it in front of, front of people or behind them so yeah. like 
it like breaks open and then yeah. You know, do they shoot them directly at people? It's you can if they're assaulted, you can shoot them directly. And it just like bruise you and then it opens up and yeah. then it gets in you. Yeah, it'd be like if you're ever hit with a paintball gun, it'd be very similar to being hit by a paintball gun, except a cloud of OC uh, particles of all in the air. Somebody secreted around the corner, you can hit the rounds off the wall without exposing yeah. yourself to somebody with a knife or whatever. Mm -hmm. As a glass breaking rounds, which, you know, it's, they're all different colors, so if you need to take a window out in a safe manner instead of using you know, have an approach it and break it or, you know, use a gun, which we would never do. And the marking rounds are if you're, you've got an instigator in a large crowd and you need to identify them as the target that the arrest team's going to make, you just mark them. True paintball. Yeah. You mark them with that and it's the, the guy with the yellow that's who you're going to move in and get. And uh, so it's got various other purposes. The way you kind of want to think of this is like a lot of stuff mirrors the stuff on our belt. It's like a pepper ball gun. It kind of mirrors OC, but you can use it from a distance. Like we can shoot this thing, you know, 60, 70, 80 feet, where the OC, uh, the, you know, this thing's lucky to go 12 feet, and then it's, you know, wind can take it and everything else. It's just able to deploy the same idea at a distance. And as far as, yeah, if someone is assaulted, they hit, but I mean, kids shoot paintballs at each other all day long. It's really not that dynamic of a, of a, of a thing. It's, it's more being able to deploy that. Uh, pepper at a large distance not to get right up on somebody. And it's just the same case law as spray OC. It's, you know, the Supreme Court decisions case law for compliance of unresponsive crowds or individuals that aren't responding to police requests legal. It's reasonable use of force in the circumstances. So the next step we have in our less lethal stuff is the 40 millimeters. So um, 40 millimeter this has a variety of different rounds that are available to it. Um, we're slowly working on platforms for different stuff we can do with this, but right now what we're using is a foam baton round. Um, so, like I said, we used to get these issues where you know, suicide by cop thing, guy calls 911 and says, I got a knife, I want to kill myself, send the cops over here. Uh, you know, we got calls. Uh, you better, you get, you get it scary, you get a chill when it's like, just send a cop here. Uh, usually people don't have like, great intentions when they make phone calls like that and you get there. As we got the knife, and it, it you know used to always be the first cop would get there, nine four, send me more cops. Can I have the knife? Drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. And the second cop gets there, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. And the third cop gets there, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. Maybe the fourth cop tries to go around the back, but he's drop the knife, drop the knife. You know, you'll have a lot of choices. You know, we don't tackle people with edge weapons for the very reasons we see that guy who got you know cut to ribbons. Um, so what this does uh, is gives you a nice intermediate. Thing that you can use. This is basically, like I said, the pepper ball gun was like deploying our OC spray at a distance. This is like a, deploying our baton at a distance. So what this shoots is a 40 millimeter uh, foam baton round. It looks like a racquetball. Um, the round we actually went to just recently is a Safari Land round. It's a crushable foam round. So it actually, when it hits, it crushes and it's meant to displace all that uh, kinetic energy into the uh, suspect. Um, a lot like the um, Baton, this has its own chart. Um, so it's similar to the um, baton chart, but it's a little different. Um, lower abdomen is considered a green zone. Big muscle groups are considered a green zone. Solar plexus, red. Um, head red, spine red. It's very similar in those means. Um, so the thing that you need to think about this is this could actually be used against an assaulted person. Chances of us using it against assaulted person, unless it's like a drawn out thing or a little, because it's in the car, you get there, I don't know, some big crazy guy is, you know, just tearing someplace to pieces. And where we've had, you know, you get through some calls, and we went to arrest a guy at McDonald's one night, and he went like this, and I jumped up on his arm, and I could have just done pull ups off of his arm. His arm didn't move when I was pulling on it. Like, this is a scenario, it's an enlarged, you know, uh, it goes on and on and on, and yeah, we can say something, get a 40 millimeter, and maybe we'll deploy this. But in most cases, you're going, you're talking, this becomes an assaultive suspect. You can't go, hold on, I'll be right back. I got something great for this in the car. So I'll take a minute, stand by. And then, um, you know, that's the way it'll, it'll go down. So they, um, this lets you use like a baton strike from a distance. If you use against the suicide by cop scenarios, a deadly force scenario, you can actually use this to target, you know, head, solar plexus, uh, um, those areas and they're more likely to neutralize a suspect 
but they're a lot less likely to kill them than a conventional firearm, which we would be justified in using at that level anyways. Um, that looks like really scary. I mean, yeah, we actually point that at somebody that would take attention. I actually, when we first got these, I brought one to a uh, a um, a call for a guy with a knife, suicide by cop. We got there. I had it slung. We just like pushed open the door. That's all. Though he looked at it and he said, "That is a, a a big gun." Yes, it is. Put down the knife. Step outside. He did. He didn't even have to point it out. So. Because it doesn't look non-lethal. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so. Um, rising gunfire deaths, they're starting to surpass automobile accidents as the way cops are dying. Um, we're not going to have time for demonstrations or the practical exercise. Any questions? Yes? If, when, when, um, when there becomes a question of, of whether or not a use of force is appropriate, what's the, what's the process? And I, I know it gets reviewed, but what is that process? And, and I mean, I, I know that some of the options are probably range from like, you know, training mm -hmm. to termination. But well, we do, I mean, the, the report form that he already explained, it goes into everything to describe right, why response was necessary, effect arrest, handcuff restraint, defense self, defend another restraint for subject safety, run escape, defense suicide, oh. et cetera. That's, that's for every, every use? That's for every use of force which is use of the time of C-spray, physical force, pepper ball, firearm, point, or aim at human, 40 millimeter, and the emergency restraint chair, which we used last night, <laughs> uh, which is all another device. So it's filed by the officer, it's reviewed by the initial supervisor, then by the shift OIC, then it goes to the defensive tactics instructor. Um, yes. For review. And then at that stage. with policy. At that stage, if there's an issue, the DT instructor might go to the supervisor, might go to the officer, and a lot of times they'll say, like, just play this out for me. A lot of times they'll they'll tell you what went on, and it's actually a fine use of force. They just didn't articulate it in the report correctly. If there's an issue above that, the DT instructor reports the training coordinator, and the administration weighs in from there as far as we've done retraining for you know minor minor stuff that's not nothing malicious, it's, it's just, you know, errors and things need to be corrected by retraining. Um, and as far as going up above that level, the chief would probably be better to answer to that. It's, and just the annually, that every supervisor has responsibility, but once a prisoner injury reports, any prisoner injury gets reviewed, we have a little different form for that to see if, you know, if there's fault of determination that correction act, corrective action could be taken, be taken with the officer. Uh, same thing for use of force, force report, uh, use of force analysis annually, pursuit analysis annually. These are all things we look at. Um, and when we look at the use of force, we look at, geez, you know, everybody else is averaging six, seven, eight OC sprays, you know, a year. And this guy's got 12. Why is that? You know, so we can break it down and find out in particularity that, well, he's just an active officer and he's downtown and he's got the bar beat and that's what's happened, you know, so. Try, we train hard, we have high accountability for the officers and we have the most department so and we review these things so we can catch small problems early and fix them and then have a good track <coughs> record if it's a repetitive. Have we ever had to terminate anybody? Disciplinary. Uh, mm, I've disciplined people for inappropriate and suspensions I've never terminated anyone. But we've never had egregious misuse of force. Most of the things I've seen, it's been like, what's the deal with that? And then you sit down and talk to the officer and they explain the report to you, like tell you what happened. And usually that's all it takes. But you know, these officers a lot of times writing these reports at three, four in the morning, they're doing the broad strokes and not the whole picture if I'm not there to like feel what was going on. And it's usually reported by the careers that so and so took a gun out when I call it need a gun for. It. Okay, that's the training moment. <coughs> Or someone deploying an AR-15 from the truck in a less than lethal situation. Do these no, trainings ever? Right? Do these trainings ever? Do the police trainings ever show situations in which you force clearly is unacceptable, so they can so officers and trainers oh, yeah. can see those? We teams? actually do. Um, well, we do live stuff, but the other thing that we do is um, at least every other year going forward. We used to do it every year, but we had some equipment stuff we wanted to cover. But every other year now, at least, we do blue line. 
which is actually a trailer that comes and it's got a projector in it, sound system, a computer, and that you have firearms instructors and actually run through real life scenarios. Well, you know, actors do them, but they'll present different weapons, different things will happen. And then once the rounds go down range, the system freezes, you can review it. You actually have bullet holes in the screen where this rounds went. And you, can, fire. you can debrief the whole situation right there. So our officers get uh, a scenario stuff like that um, very regularly. The other thing we do, even if we do, like we did a spring range last year to get some rifle work done because guys were having some trouble with the rifles, and we do stuff with moving targets, situational targets where you'll be presented with a target, you don't know when it's going to happen, and you've got to look at two different targets, decide are they good guys, bad guys, am I going to engage them, what, what's going on with that, and then we debrief from there. So. We, we do quite a lot of situational stuff, it's actually a but, requirement. But, I mean, are, are, are there's, are there, are, do those have like right and wrong answer situations? Oh, yeah. oh they do? Yeah. Oh. Well, they can, it's interactive, so the orders can be given, they can comply, you do the right thing. It's just, it's it's not just like an old, they used to have just a film, shoot, don't shoot, you know, and they, they can, the, the instructor goes through these dynamic things, if the officer's doing something wrong, you can tweak it to go in a different direction. And it's, I'll tell you what, it's anybody that's been through it and you make a mistake when you shoot somebody that didn't have a gun but it sort of looked like it because you overreacted or you didn't see cover first before you made a decision. You didn't use your right tactical plan to avoid being in the line of fire, all those things. These are all the things that we try to get in people's minds. So when they're faced with it, it should come out automatically. So the you other, said you have an eight hour training for officers and then you have a, a well, that's at the police academy. Just this block, like that module, like the yeah. force continuum, that would be eight hours. Yeah, that's in the what police academy. Okay. So, and yeah. then they they have weekly eight hours, you know, up to eighty hours of, of during their police academy training to focus on it. So there's hands-on stuff in that. Right. But they usually start every DT day off with a quiz that says Graham versus Connor, show them the totality triangle. They have to fill in that force continuum from top to bottom by by memory. Oh, okay. So, and then the other question visual. was this I, I mean, this was, I know we, you expanded it beyond what you were planning on in 26 minutes, but, and, and it was very informative, really helpful. You said that we also offer a four hour, or a th was it a three hour yep. for the Citizens the Police Citizen Academy? Citizens Police Academy. It's okay, three and is it generally going over a lot of what we've seen? A lot here? of what, it, it, what would go over after this was you'd actually see some live demonstrations of compliance techniques, um, different stuff. We've done, depending on, what we've had the resources, we've had students shoot 40 millimeters, we've done a bunch of different things. So it kind of brings in the physical stuff to it. A lot of times I'll have an officer work with me and I'll just show like, like this is what we can do. And like, you know, if you see this, this is actually a, a compliance technique instead of a strike. Whereas if you see someone doing this, this is a whole nother. Uh, and, and remind me again, the, the Citizens Police Academy is a, it it's goes over how many weeks and how many? Uh, and that's just eight now. Yeah. Eight, eight weeks at three hours a, 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 a session? Or is it something different like that? blocks have different. So, so I oh, get okay. DT, usually it's two, not, a, two like a, a night we'll get like two subjects, but DT they give us the full three hours. Oh, okay. And usually by the end of it, we so have it students asking questions and it runs uh -huh. it runs over. But yeah, it's a three hour block. And and that program is still well, really yeah. well attended. We've had, um, in fact, an human rights question people Everybody that's been on the Human Rights Commission has come to see the whole thing. Uh -huh. And all of them have come and said it's really like them. Yeah. When they sit in their position about complaints against officers. And oh, like you're saying they came to the response to resistance They portion. did a whole CPA. Oh, oh, the whole, they did a whole CPA. Oh, okay. Yeah, because they usually get complaints from citizens that have to go and explain, 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 and then when they got the, the, the cutting as on a realistic thing, it made their... Just out of curiosity, have any of our... Uh, I, you, <coughs> first year... For sure, I was a counselor, so I have to say it, it, it's it's a lot different. Uh, that was Jesus. That was 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, I took it. I think it was the first year that was offered when um, with community policing. Right, the James House, right? Yep. Yeah. We were doing a James House, and uh, yeah, and I walked into OC spray. I volunteered to get. Actually, I ended up getting volunteered for 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, as I recall, that was an easy mark. But um, it's different now. It's it, there's a lot more sophistication now um, and gradations. It wasn't quite as nuanced when 
when I took it. So it used to be it's a, the whole like levels of compliance you used to have yes people, no people, and maybe people. Yeah, exactly. And it used to be a pyramid and there wasn't the lines and right. it's it's changed. Some people like the stuff a lot of stuff we have to keep up on the stuff officers were training way back in the day. Like back in the day you could use pain compliance on a on a passive resistant person. And then you know you get an officer who's been on the department for years and years, and you read a report, and you're like, "Whoa, what's what's going on here?" Well, well, <laughs> work that night. Where, where did you come up with this? And they're like, "Well, when I went to the academy, when you went to the academy, the cop cars were square and <laughs> right, right. With wheels, and whole new." Yeah, so I mean that, that's. I mean, honestly, it was the it was escalating levels of response based on uh, there what there wasn't. A, what you showed, which was the variable, the dynamic range of uh, response versus threat. This was, here's your stages of threat. It escalated, regardless, it was an escalating, uh, and, and it was escalated use of force uh, to respond to escalating situations. And it wasn't, it didn't, didn't take into account that it could de-escalate oh, pronto or. The other thing that we do for live training, and it's very valuable, is we do active shooter training in the schools and that is a whole bunch of situational right. training they throw everything at you that the guy doesn't have a weapon you think he does you get in there it, it's you leave that day like sweating like it's one of those things that it really gets you like in the moment it gets your your you know juices flowing and you you have to make decisions under pressure so our guys get a good amount of situational training dynamic training we just don't you know it's not like pen and paper right, right. We're working together in teams everybody you know so we're kind of running over I'm going to yeah. ask if anybody has I'm going to move it along a little bit just because it's getting close to 7 30. No. Yeah, again I, every newly elected counselor I sent an invitation for a full CPA this year yeah. the new ones and others I think I sent out that I could arrange for anybody to come to the full presentation um, which I don't yeah, think I, and I, haven't, I haven't been able to do it myself but I really but like even that's the use of force segment yeah. I think given this Age, it would have been nice and mm -hmm. regrettably no one could attend. So mm -hmm. I think it's good. Um, but how often does the academy once a year? Yeah, so okay. okay. It's all about the education. And once yeah. you're educated and aware of it, you might have a different perspective. Right? That's one thing you definitely notice. I like seeing the scenarios mm -hmm. when you watch the beginning, and you have students that are like, I don't know if the cops should have done this. And by the end, they're like, that. That should not be going down like that. And the ripple effect that I think it has, it's been started to talk about IACP, and I think you mentioned it, is that officers are so worried about not making the wrong decision, but being held accountable for the right decision, that there's a hesitancy in a lot of lethal situations. I, I One of our officers actually said to me when they were going to a call at CDH with a guy running around with a screwdriver, that they were hoping on the way there that they were the same race as the person that was was there. I mean, when you've got questions like that going through people's heads, like it's it's you know, down in the air case where the guy has the sharp stick stabbed an officer twice, three other officers are there, and everybody hesitated until he came at the guy, and only one other officer shot and took the guy down. And it was like, and they did a shoot snare, and everybody was like. You want to be the one. You don't want to be the one. You know, like another opportunity. You let this go. It's very difficult situation at times to try to define this if people understand. But the case law applies with the consistency of what the officer perception is. That OC is a compliance technique, not a use of force. So I mean, it's just whatever. This is really helpful. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? She's or? got the. Uh, the presentation, presentation in the video sounds got a thumbstick, so. So we'll keep that as part of the minutes and, you know, other, we'll make sure that other counselors know, too, and remind them, maybe to be the president, to uh, take advantage of the Citizens Police Academy, and, mm -hmm. or at least the use of force segment. We've already done it, so it's good. Right, yeah, for, this, for this year, for the next year. In spite of little postponements. Thank you, Sergeant. Sorry, I ran over. I kind of figured. No, it's it really. Well, really knowing you, start your time. Well, so I'll ask uh, counselors if there isn't any more business. If there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I have anything?
Okay, thank you everyone.